went to university a couple years ago um, where I was a DJ at a bar and uh, I was always wondering if there's a way to play music, um, I guess more or less strategically, that could be used to drive bar sales. Uh, I'm not going to go too much into that uh, lab right now, but it ended up um, catching the attention of this prof at University of Toronto, <coughs> who, who, who basically let me know that um, anybody who is qualified to study nightclubs right now is like in their 40s or 50s, they've got 10 years of doctoral research, and they don't really care about nightclubs, they've never been to one, and they probably couldn't get into one uh, if they wanted to. So we'll start with, um, with uh, what is a nightclub. Um, a nightclub's been around for 40 years, more or less, like think like Studio 54 and the Saints back in the 70s. And um, you're putting a species um, that's been evolving for millions of years uh, inside this room. So in terms of evolutionary time, that's actually a really, really small sliver. <clears throat> and um, yeah, so there's a bunch of different variables that go into, I guess, like a, a nightclub journey. Um, there's music and lighting. Music is something that I'm, I guess, most passionate about. These two affect your, um, your sensory interpretation of the night. And an important thing to, notice about, to note about music is that um, it's kind of a mystery to how it evolved. Uh, every single person in the world likes music to some extent. It's cross-cultural, and it's been like that for every civilization um, as far back as we can document. <clears throat> So in terms of natural selection, that means that the people who liked music uh, lived to pass on their genes to their offspring, and the people that didn't like it died. So a big, uh, <laughs> a big mystery is, is what is the survival advantage to music, and people have taken a bunch of different theories at it um, and a bunch of different stabs, but uh, I'm going to get into mine in just a minute. So you've got music and lighting. Um, those two are affecting your senses. Then you've got drugs and alcohol, which are affecting your perception, so how you're actually interpreting the information throughout the night. <clears throat> and then you've got sex and social status, which are actually what the commodities in a nightclub are. Um, a nightclub does not sell alcohol, it sells sex and social status, but we'll get to that in a minute. And then on top of all that, there's an entirely different set of rules. There's different social norms inside a club, so if you want to go and say, talk to a girl and buy her a drink or invite her to your booth, then you can do that but it wouldn't necessarily go over as, uh, you know, as easily in um, like a grocery store or something like that. Uh, in terms of <clears throat> the legalities within a nightclub, uh, there's an entire, th this part of society um, operates on an entirely different set of rules. So people break the law inside there all the time, but they're making the club so much money that um, to kind of sum things up, everybody's paid off to look the other way. <clears throat> so most, most of my research is, uh, is on the side of alcohol. Um, if you think of like the duality that exists inside, inside of people, you've got um, your biology or, or your innermost drives, um, kind of what makes us human, and then <clears throat> the, your sociology, and, and that's more or less like the social norms. So, um, you know, uh, like an example could be that you want to, like your biology is saying, um, go and get that Big Mac, and your sociology is saying, um, don't do that, like you have to stay fit and in, sh and in shape uh, so you can attract members of the opposite sex or whatever. So by drinking alcohol, it actually knocks out um, the top level cognitive processes in your brain um, and it exposes the more primitive drives, which are food, water, sex, and aggression. <clears throat> and if you think of all those in terms of a nightclub context, uh, water's pretty obvious, everybody's drinking, uh, sex, people hook up in a nightclub, Aggression, 50% uh, of all violent crimes are alcohol related. And food, kind of like the example before, like after the bar, you don't go somewhere for a salad. You go there, you go out for like a cheeseburger or fries or something like that. So I've done about 12 studies over the last four or five years. And tonight I'm only going to talk about my most recent one, um, which is what I spoke about at TED in Long Beach this year uh, with James. But they cut me off after four minutes, so I didn't really get all my thoughts out. So... <clears throat> um, being a uh, part of being a, like a good DJ is to look at the room and to play what they want to hear. So you have to be constantly reading the crowd. So if you play a song that goes over really well uh, by this group of people, then you have to remember a couple other songs that go along well with that. Keep it in the back of your mind. Then play for another part of the crowd, and then incorporate those in throughout the night. If you just want to play what you want to hear, uh, you're not going to have a good night. The bar is going to suffer. People aren't going to have a good time. They're not going to come back, <clears throat> and uh, you're probably not not going to get hired to play at that place again. So 
the idea for this study, which I'll get to in a second, came about right around the time of the economic recession, around 2008. I was booked to play at this bar. It was like two weeks after the big crash and everybody was in panic um, about losing money and everything like that. This is a room that I played like probably dozens of times. And, um, oh, thanks. <clears throat> this is a room that I played dozens of times and like, uh, I knew, like there were so many familiar faces in there, I knew exactly what people wanted to hear, but for some reason they were only responding to this kind of music that's called uh, Electro House. And electro is really fast and it's in minor keys. So a quick offshoot on like, I guess, music theory. Um, you've got tempo, which ranges from slow to fast, um, and that's just the number of beats per minute. And then you've got modality, um, which is, you know, if something's major or minor. Um, an untrained ear can tell you within a few notes, usually if something is major because it sounds happy, and the same with minor, because it sounds sad. So <clears throat> that night, like after the gig, um, I hit up all my other buddies who were DJing around town, and I was like, did you guys notice something weird about where you were playing? And everyone kind of came to the same conclusion that, that for some reason, um, you know, and it, it was like the, the, the recession was fresh in everybody's mind, but for some reason they were only craving this style of music. So what I did was I took um, every song that's ever touched ground anywhere on the Billboard Hot 100 charts, and I cross-referenced that with the Dow Jones Industrial Average to see if there is a relationship <laughs> between like, literally how much money is in our pockets and, and how we feel and what music we listen to. And together I did, I put this paper out with uh, my prof, Robert Brim from University of Toronto, and we found there is actually, um, I, at first glance it was a 76% correlation, or 0.76, and if we hit 0.6 we were gonna get published, so we went through and we checked all the numbers again, and there's a point of inflection right around 2000, which has to do with when MP3s were becoming more popular. So basically before 2000, um, to 76% accuracy, we could tell you, based on where the Dow Jones sits on a Friday, what the characteristics of pop music are gonna be next week. And then after 2000, it moved up to 86%. Um, <clears throat> so economic busts are, are therefore like associated with up-tempo and minor key music, and uh, economic economic booms are associated with, with slower music, more or less in major keys. Now, correlation doesn't necessarily equal causality. Um, and so, oh, and actually I'm just gonna go to this quickly too, because right when this came out, a lot of people were like, oh no, it's seasonal, you know, they release, um, they release sad music during the winter and happier music during the summer. But uh, this is a graph of everything in 2008, every key, like the tempo and key of every song um, from weeks one through 52, and it shows you basically that everything is coming out all across the map. This is like a textbook correlation of, or a textbook, you know, zero correlation. So everything's being released, but only certain tracks are being picked up. And the big question is, why are certain tracks being picked up? <clears throat> so the theory behind it is to think of money as resources, which are making you feel a certain way. So the amount of resources that you have um, influence the emotion and stress. So today it's how much money you have in your pocket or your bank account. Uh, thousands of years ago it was like how many woolly mammoths you had uh, lying next to you to feed your family. Um, but they both induce a certain kind of brain chemistry, which is that you're probably familiar with, it's called the fight or flight response. And whether or not you know, you're actually staring like down the mouth of a tiger and you have to figure out whether to, to you know, whether to, to fight or to flee, um, you're still, you're under this constant stress and it's, it's like your brain is percolating these, these neurochemicals, there's more adrenaline, you're constantly on edge. It has to re reach a certain activation energy and we can go in, if, the, if people want to talk about that after, um, we can go into it, but for the sake of time, um, the big factor <clears throat> involved with all this is when we listen to music. So. If you're in a bum mood and you go and listen to music at home, you might want to you know, listen to something that more or less matches your personality um, or your personality right at that point in time. If you're in a bum mood and you end up going to the bar where this, you know, this is about buying bottles and a bottle is very much a prop, a, a prop displaying resources, fin financial resources, number of bottles at your table. You know, if you spend a certain amount of money, you're sitting in a better part of the club. Um, when you're at those clubs, regardless of how you feel, you, the, the mentality behind these bottle buyers is they want to look as if the recession isn't bothering them. And so it mirrors all the way down to um, how we feel and whether or not music is an emotional reflection um, where, it, where it inverts or it's a mirror. But um, another thing about the strength of the data, 
Uh, there was the payola scandals in 2005 where radio labels, or, uh, where record labels were paying radio to promote their tracks um, to get them big. Uh, and then also, like before that, when all the power was at, um, was more or less in the, in the hands of the record labels, music was, in, uh, was produced uh, on vinyl, then it moved to CD and then MP3s, and then now what we call the super MP3, where it's, you know, it's by far like the dominant form of music that's being shared on the internet. So less power is going towards the labels and more towards the tastemakers. So every day, um, the shift is going that way, and the musical taste has always followed this pattern. And then uh, just a quick teaser um, about more or less like the nightclub psychology and sociology that, I, that I've been studying and writing about for a couple years. I've got a book coming out at uh, probably within two or three months from now. Um, if you go to darwinversusthemachine.com, that's my blog right now. You can also join the mailing list to, figure, to find out when the book comes out. It deals a lot with rationality and decision making, uh, particularly when we do it when these nightclub stresses are, are put on people. Uh, we talk about uh, why we listen to music, and then we compare sexual, sexual selection in nightclubs to a lot of different animal behavior models, uh, particularly with primates. And um, yeah, I think it's an interesting read, so if you enjoyed this talk, hopefully you can pick up a copy of the book. And then the 194group.com is my corporate website uh, where we do music branding. So if you know what your brand looks like, we figure out what it sounds like, and then we connect you with an audience. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in any of those, please talk to me after, and then I guess that's it. So. Any questions? Or? Thank you.